Word of God. James 1, 26 and 27. Will you just bow your heads with me as we give this time uh, to the Lord? God, we are grateful for your word. We're grateful that uh, you created us and that you spoke this word into existence, that we might know you, we might know ourselves, we might know the way to redemption. That you didn't leave us groping around in the dark. God, to, to, uh, to obey you, didn't, we didn't, you didn't leave us groping around in the dark to know how to please you. God, that you gave us your word, that we might know you, know ourselves, and glorify you with our obedience. And so God, we pray today as we uh, look at James 1, 26 and 27. As it, as it puts a mirror up in front of our own hearts and souls, God, I pray that you would be tender and gracious with us this morning and that you might lead us into grace, lead us into passion, uh, and that we might, through obedience, bring new life to our lives, areas of our lives that have been dead, areas of our lives that have been necrotic. God, I pray that you would do the work of changing us today, that as we leave, we might look more like your son. In your name we pray. Amen. I've heard this phrase a lot this week. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. My mom and dad were in town for uh, a week to celebrate New Year's and, and Christmas. And uh, I found them looking at my kids, my four kids, and then looking at me and saying, oh, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And actually, like, I, I knew this was true, especially for my older son, Eli, uh, when we gave birth, well, Vanessa gave birth and I watched. Uh, we took this picture of him and it was early in Facebook, uh, Facebook's time where they did facial recognition. And so I uploaded to Facebook and, you know, it asked me if I wanted to tag a picture of myself and it was a picture of my son. The apple does not fall, fall far from the tree. It's interesting, the more, the older I get, and I'm 40 now, the more I realize that is true. And what I mean is, uh, I am, in large part, the best and worst of my dad and the best and worst of my mom. That I am who I am because of who my parents were and how my parents were. And my kids, all four of them, will become, in large part, uh, who they are because of who Vanessa and I are and how we are who we are. That is, our strengths and weaknesses, our passions, how we're wired, uh, how we've become with our strengths and weaknesses. All those things, as parents, we understand we replicate that into our children. Most of the time, we're just disciplining ourselves out of our kids. Every parent understands that. Like, I am a college football fan and a really sad college football fan this morning because of my dad. I'm a preacher in large part because of my dad. Whatever generosity or, or bent towards hospitality I have, I have from my mom, not my dad. Whatever counseling giftedness I have also comes from my mother. And so, like, another way to think of it is when you see me, you're seeing a lot of my mom and dad. Just by virtue of them raising me and me watching how to be a man uh, and to grow. If you look at me, you'll see them. And this is really just, this is a side note, this is part of the maturation process. As we grow in adulthood, you should ask yourself the question, how did I become this way? Like, how am I? Who am I? Like, how did it become this way? You'll noodle on that for a while. <laughs> it's the same spiritually, too. James 1.18 says this. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. That is, uh, we talked about this a few weeks ago or a month and a half ago, that as Christians we have been uh, born again by the will and the power of God, that he chose to regenerate us, to, to give us a new birth. That is, he became our heavenly father. And so we begin asking ourselves a question. If it's true that we are who we are, in large part at least by who our parents were, both positive and negative, we ask ourselves a question. What does it look like to become new in the image of our Heavenly Father? That if you're looking at me and you see an image uh, of my mom and dad, then what does it look like for us to ask the question, how do I know I'm imaging my Father, my Heavenly Father, to the world? And so I want to look at James 1, 26 and 27 this morning. And I want to, I want to pull out uh, three tests of true religion for the Christian this morning. Three tests that, just heads up, we're all going to fail. Happy New Year. <laughs> we're all, like when, when, when it comes up, we're all going to fail these in, different, in, in, in varying degrees. And then at the end of that, one exhortation 
for the new year. Verse 26. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. It might help us to define what the word religion means in this passage. James uses it three times and it means this. Religion is what we actually believe worked out in our lives. That we tend to think of the word religion as a negative word, right? Say, so I want to be a Christian. I don't want to be religious. I don't want to be one of those people who has, has an empty faith, who goes on Sunday morning, whose life is totally different, who comes on Christmas and Easter, who says things, but whose life is completely dis, dis, uh, or incongruent from what, from what they say. And yet James is, is going to try to show us what positive, a positive version of religion should be and what the negative results of religion, of negative religion are. And so my hope is that as we, as we kind of uh, look at this word, that we can actually reclaim this word and that you all can leave here more religious because you're willing to practice more what you believe. That's religion. That at the deepest part of who you are, you want that worked out in your life. Positively, a religion would be, the, for the Christian, the continued growth in conforming our lives to Christ empowered by grace. That the positive version of what it looks like for you to be religious is not law. It's not you working to do and to should and to could. It is empowered by the grace of God. You grow daily until death when you are glorified and you walk into heaven made whole. That's, that's positive religion that you, deep in your heart, realize you are transformed and being transformed and you want to work that out everywhere. Negatively, it is, uh, negative religion is law-based living empowered by dry obligation. It's lame and otherwise. Like, people who live religious lives have no interest in grace because grace is of no use to them. They have no interest in giving you grace because grace uh, is no use to anyone. If you mess up or if they mess up, it's not, we need to repent. It's, I just need to do better, to do more. I should be here. And the, and the law is there and the law is here. And everywhere you look is law, law, shame, shame, brokenness. It is a joyless, environment. People who are religious have very little engagement with the church and its people. No desire for it. I just say this. One of the most important parts of your faith are the people of the church. You neglect them to your own religious peril. I'm not saying that just because I'm the pastor. I'm saying that because I've benefited from having men and women speak into my life who are Christian, who love the Lord, who have shaped me. We need that. God has given us that. So what does true religion look like? If, if James is, is defining religion as uh, what we do, like, what, what, like it's worked out what we actually believe, well then let's look at three tests of true religion uh, really quickly here. I, I say this too, these aren't comprehensive. Like James chooses three things to, to kind of put in front of us. Uh, Bible reading isn't one of them. Prayer isn't one of them. Church engagement is one of them. He's chosen three that, that provide us a litmus test this morning to see where our hearts are at. And I just, I, I warn you, all of us are a mixture of positive and negative. And all of us are going to fail one of these tests to some degree. And all of these tests, when they're put up against our lives, should sting a little. They're designed to. Again, Happy New Year. Three tests of true religion. Test number one. The test of the tongue. The test of the tongue. Verse 26. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. And so James is, is saying, listen, if there's a person out there hypothetically who says, I follow Jesus and I'm truly one of his, but his tongue, his speech is complete, completely out of control and unbridled, he deceives himself that he actually doesn't know Jesus. That someone who's, who's, whose tongue is persistently and unrepentantly unbridled, out of control. He deceives his heart that he has no place, that he is, he is not, he's not actually met Jesus. A bridle, for those who don't know, is a, uh, is, a, is a harness they put on the horse and it goes in his mouth. 
No, uh, uh, the harness can turn it left, the horse left, right, and it can make it stop. Uh, a harness, this, this, uh, this bridle, is not a muzzle. James isn't saying uh, the only way to control your tongue is to not say anything. He's saying, no, the way to control your tongue is to, is to yield to the Holy Spirit, to give yourself to Jesus, and then let Jesus control and bridle your tongue. Notice how he says he deceives his own heart. That you can begin to see what a person actually believes when you observe how their tongue operates. I'm not really concerned necessarily about what the tongue says, but how it operates to serve that person. The words of Jesus help us uh, expand this a little bit. Matthew 15, 18. But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart. And these defile these, these defile them. Remember, James and Jesus were, were, were brothers. And, and what James is showing, James isn't showing us law. He's showing us Jesus. And so as we're exhorted to bridle our tongue, we're exhorted to be like Jesus and to understand the issue is not with the tongue. Let me, just to show, it's, it's early. I want to raise your hand if your mom ever had to wash your mouth out with soap. Right, 100%, right? My mom and dad did too. You know what? It didn't work. Do you know why? Because the tongue wasn't the problem. My heart was. They couldn't wash that. Now, they could wash my, wash my tongue and create moralistic boundaries of which I had to live in, but that couldn't change the actual problem. They couldn't do what needed to be done in my heart. And so they washed the tongue, and I hated it, and, and all of this. What James and Jesus are trying to communicate is what comes out of the mouth is the fruit of the root of the problem. The root is the actual heart. That how you see someone's mouth operate is an indication of their heart. So I want to ask two questions. Number one, how does a fully unbridled tongue operate? That's what I mean is, how does, if we were to play this out to the full extreme, someone with a completely unbridled tongue with no control, it doesn't really care, what does that look like? What does it sound like? Well, uh, this person uses gossip freely to spread untruth about someone in order to make themselves look good. This person uses slander freely to tear others down in order to make themselves look better. This person uses rage freely to intimidate and consolidate and keep power. This person uses falsehood freely to leverage situations to their favor. This person uses coarse language freely to garner acceptance or status. And here's what I'm saying is when we think about the, the extreme uh, person, which he's kind of presenting here as, as unbridled, one who does, has no controls, no cares, and just lives their life from their heart, and it, and it represents who they are, this person uses their tongue to get what they want from other people and to, and to slash people down, and they do that unrepentantly and all the time. Now, look, all of us are good Christians here. That wouldn't describe pretty much anyone in this room. But if, what if we changed it to maybe describe like all of us? What if we just changed the word freely to occasionally. It would sound like this. This person uses gossip occasionally to spread untruth about someone in order to make themselves look good. And so we do, well, I, I bridle my tongue for most of the time, but just occasionally about this one person. They use slander occasionally to tear others down. They use rage occasionally to intimidate and consolidate power. And it goes on and on. Most of us, if we were to just continue on, would find ourselves in this occasional, in this occasional usage where we would say, we bridle our tongue most of the time, or I bridle my tongue better than that person bridles their tongue, or whatever version of self-righteousness we've got. We use these things occasionally. An unbridled tongue is so powerful, an indicator of false faith, James says that this person's religion is worthless. It's somebody who gives themselves over fully to an unbridled tongue whose tongue is out of control and serves them for their own needs. Their faith, their religion is worthless. A person who says they've met Jesus and given them his life but live with an unbridled tongue with no repentance, no confession, no restraint have shown that when they haven't met Jesus and their religion is worthless, James says, which is fruitless, it's empty, it's powerless, it lacks truth, it's not true religion is what James is saying. And so I just offer this as we put this test in front of us, like what does it look like to bridle your tongue? It should sting a little bit. 100% of us are occasional bridlers of our tongue. 100% of us. All of us fail this test at some area. If you've met Jesus and given him your life, your heart has changed. And as a result, your tongue will change. 
over time. Second test of true religion, the first is the test of the tongue. How well we bridle our tongue is a good indicator of the trueness of our religion, of the trueness of our faith. Number two, it's a test of, a, of the heart, a test of the heart. Verse 27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. So James, writing to a predominantly Jewish, uh, Jewish uh, culture, writes and says, look, uh, religion that is pure and undefiled, and the image that, that you should get, that they get, is a perfect lamb, a spotless lamb, pure and undefiled, something that would go uh, to sacrifice. What James is saying is, listen, religion that is pure and undefiled is at least first to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. Pure, pure and spotless or undefiled. It's kind of hard for us to grasp. But the opposite is a little bit easier for us to grasp. So what is, what is unpure and defiled? Well, it's a Christian. It's someone who says, I'm religious, I'm a mature Christian, but they've adopted the worldly ways of thinking about money, about wealth, about sexuality, about life, about satisfaction, about all these things. That inside their worldview of Christianity is an acceptance of worldview and idolatry of the world. And so this person is double-minded and ends up, ends up being defiled in their obedience and defiled before the Lord because they haven't accepted all the Lord has. And so James says, listen, one of the first ways, one of the first tests is whether or not you'll go and visit orphans and widows in their time of trouble, in their affliction, in their time uh, of pain. As a church, like we see like we're supposed to take care of widows and orphans. Like that's a normal thing. And yet in, in this passage, James qualifies it in their affliction. There's something there that's worth asking ourselves the question. Like why does James single out widows and orphans? Why not other people, other vulnerable categories? Well, let me give you three reasons why James singles out widows and orphans. Number one, they are the category of people who would stir a father's heart. You notice uh, James in James uh, 29 or 27, he says, before God the Father. Then all of a sudden, God is no longer this, this distant thing that, that in here he's God the Father. That, that what father wouldn't be stirred? By an orphan, by a widow. He is God the Father. His heart is stirred toward compassion for their plight and his heart is stirred in anger towards their abusers. We were once orphaned, lost. We were once afflicted by sin, uh, headed towards a crisis eternity. That when we talk about orphans and, and, and widows and, and the most vulnerable of society, we, see, we should see ourselves. We should understand that it was God who acted on his love to draw us near. It was us who were far off and God brought us near. And so when we talk about loving the most vulnerable and the, most, uh, uh, the, the widow and the orphan, what we're really saying is we love those people because that's a heart God had for us that our working out of orphans and widows and loving those in the margins is a working out of our understanding of who we were before God saved us. So number one, why does James single out widows and orphans for particular care? They're a category of people that would stir a father's heart. Number two, widows and orphans uh, in the ancient Near East in this time had a particular, a particular negative plight. A widow would have very few rights, very little social mobility, an orphan the same way. They would often be the most vulnerable, often be the most likely to be taken advantage of, and most likely to be forgotten or abused. But as we think about uh, this particular class of people, if you, if you wanted to say, I, I love the Lord, I'm pursuing him. James is putting before uh, the, his people and us this morning, how much do you care for those who God cares for? Leading into the third, the third answer to the question, why does James single out widows and orphans for particular care? Well, Israel had a history of playing church. Israel had a history of offering sacrifices. Israel had a history uh, of, of going through religious motions and saying, we're holy, we're religious. But when you look at the minor prophets, do you know what the Lord charges them with uh, when, uh, when, when he says, like, Babylon's gonna come and Assyria's gonna come, judgment's gonna come? Do you know what, what, he, what, what charge? It's you didn't love the widows, you didn't love the orphans, you didn't love the most vulnerable around you. You said you were holy, you did the sacrifices, but your heart was far from me. And the way that I knew that was that you didn't care about those most vulnerable. Isaiah 1 16 and 17. This is Isaiah to Israel, to the Lord of the Israel, the Israelites. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove your evil, the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and plead the widow's cause. Jeremiah 22, 3. Thus says the Lord, do justice and righteousness, and deliver from the hand of the oppressor him who has been robbed, and do no wrong or violence to the resident alien, the fatherless, or the widow, nor shed innocent 
blood in this place. Zechariah 7, 9, 10. 7, 9, and 10. Thus says the Lord of hosts, render true judgments. Show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor. Let none of you devise evil against another in your heart. True religion is concerned with the people God is most concerned about. A mark of true religion, that is a true devotion to God, to Jesus, will be an increased selflessness. In other words, the more that you pursue Jesus, the more that you find him beautiful, the more that you obey and, and by, by do it, build new life into your life, you will find yourself less important. You will find your things less important. Selflessness will begin to pervade your life because you'll find that everything you've been given is his and he's just given it to you to steward. You know, I was thinking this week about this particular passage and I realized as I reflected from my own heart, like what is my own heart for the, the widows and the orphans and in their distress? You know what the honest, the honest like, answer was? I just had pity for them. And pity is like love that just sits on a couch and does nothing. I feel bad you're in that space. Here's a sandwich. That's pity. Compassion is what's being called for here. Compassion is love that moves. It's love in action. If I say, I love the Lord and I pursue him, but my heart is far from this moment, far from these people, I have to ask myself the question, why? What is it in my heart? What is it in this situation? Does my heart reflect the Father's love for the vulnerable? Does my life reflect the action my father would take for the vulnerable? Does, does, do, do, simply pity, uh, do I simply pity the vulnerable around me or do I love the vulnerable around me? True religion is moved like a father would be moved. That, that a father who loves the orphans, a father who loves the widows, a father who loves on the margins, moves, can't sit on the couch, isn't worried about the risk, isn't worried about the cost, but goes to the margins and protects and loves and embraces and cries and laughs with. That's what James is getting at here. Fake religion is unmoved and stays distant because it costs too much and it's too messy. It's so interesting. Like, we do this thing. We, we live in this, like, wonderful society. And I mean that, like, without, without any flippancy at all. Like, what an amazing country we live in. We have these cool social nets, right? We've got social security. We've got welfare. We've got food stamps. We've got WIC. We've got all these cool things, right? There's a very real sense in which the church, not just us, but the church, has abdicated its role in caring for those on the margins of society, and we've handed it over to the government. And you know what? The government is super bad at it. And it's not because they're Democrats, not because they're Republicans. It's because they're not us. Like God gave us these things to steward well, to give generously, to give risk. Okay, like that's not, okay. I gotta keep moving, but like we live in a society and we've allowed the government to do that for us. And some of us are, like I'm content for that. That's my own heart problem. That when I, when I see this, oh, well there's a foster home. Foster homes are brutal. Group homes are brutal. Test three. Test of the whole life. If James didn't get you with a tongue, he didn't get you with widows and orphans, he's about to get all of us with the whole life. Last half of verse 27. And to keep oneself, that is true and undefiled religion, is to keep oneself unstained from the world. To keep oneself unstained from the world. And all God's people said, ugh. <laughs> Impossible. Thank you, James. We have, to ask, ask, we have to ask ourselves the question, what is the world here? Like, what is James meaning by the world? Alec Motyer, uh, a theologian, said this, the world is anything and everything that is at odds with the lordship of Christ over our lives. I'll say that again. The world, as James is talking about it, as keeping one itself unstained from the world, the world is anything and everything that is at odds with the lordship of Christ over our lives. It's human philosophy. It's human goals. It's human reasoning. It's human wisdom. 
wisdom, it's human laws, it's the pursuit of human satisfaction and glory without need or reference to God. In other words, it is anything in the world that would call unto your heart, that would call unto your mind and say, God doesn't know what he's doing, God isn't enough, Uh, don't obey him, it's all these things that hearken to us say, he shouldn't be Lord, you know better. That is the world. And they want our values, they want your mind, they want your wisdom. To live unstained then is to resist the siren calls of worldly wisdom, worldly values, worldly pursuits, and worldly desires. To live unstained is a minute-by-minute declaration that the desires and the values and the pursuits of this world are not fit for a child of God. That you have to decide that. If you want to live unstained from this world, you must declare from deep inside your soul, minute by minute, that the values, the desires, and the pursuits of this world are not fit for a child of God. To live unstained is a minute-by-minute commitment to make Jesus the Lord of your heart, mind, soul, and life. We live stained lives as Christians when we adopt the world's view on money, on power, when we adopt the world's views on personal fulfillment and life satisfaction, when we adopt the world's views on sexuality, gender, marriage, when we adopt the world's views on sin and the need for salvation. We live stained lives when we willfully adopt a worldly framework of thinking that is in direct opposition to the revealed world of God, the revealed word of God. In other words, when we adopt worldly thinking, worldly actions follow. This is what James is getting at. If you, are, if, you are, if you have true religion, then you follow who Jesus is and who God the Father is, and that works its way out in your life. But if you follow the world, if you are theirs, then that will work its way out into your life as well. And this is the hard part about living unstained, is that if the challenge of living unstained was only five big things, or you just had to not murder somebody, or not commit adultery, most of us in this room would live unstained. Because those are two big things we can prepare for, and get ready for. But what, what, what James is saying is, it is a minute by minute, day by day, month by month, year by year, until which point you are called home, it is a journey of obedience in the same direction over a long period of time. That's sanctification, by the way. To live unstained is a lifelong journey. After all, we know adultery doesn't start in the hotel room. It starts with unchecked glances. We know murder doesn't start with the pulling of a trigger. It starts with unchecked anger. No one in here lives completely unstained from the world. That's an impossibility. And James here isn't suggesting perfection. He's suggesting that to live unstained is a long life of obedience in the same direction. Holiness. If you're like me, you heard this, and you're like, oh, super. I failed this test. I got a C on that one. I got a D minus on that test. That can be discouraging. What I want to do, just with my time left, I want to offer you one exhortation this morning that I want you to write down. I want everyone to grab your phone. I want you to grab a pen. This is worth the price of admission. Your price of admission was free, so it's worth that much. I want you to write this down. If we're going to live freely, if we're going to, if we're going to, to look at what God has given us and, and these tests and we realize we're not yet done, we're not there, here's what I, here's what I just, I read, I read something recently and it, just, it, it shook me in a really good way. Trade should for can this year. Trade should for can. Most of us, myself included, will live much of our Christian lives enchained to the word should. I should be further along. I should do this. I shouldn't have done that. I should already be this. These shoulds are usually attached to shame because they're attached to the law. 
And so what happens is you find yourself in this weird cycle where you should have been better by now, and then you feel shame that you're not there, and then what happens? Shame incapacitates you. It doesn't move you forward. And so then you're, then you're stuck here, and you go, oh, man, I really should be further, and you feel more shame, and you're more incapacitated, and you go, oh, crap, I'm still here. I feel more shame, and I should be further. It is this death cycle of spirituality which Satan loves to have you in because Satan loves to use shame to keep you broken. He says, listen, you're right, you should be. God is disappointed with you. You're right. You should be. He's tired of giving you grace. What's wrong with you? I want to tell you right now that is satanic from the pit of hell. God does not look at you like that ever. He has not once looked at one of his children with disdain or reproach, and he's not starting with you. So what does that mean? (laughs) What does that mean? It means if we trade the shoulds and we kind of put them up, It means, it sounds more like this. This year, I can bridle my tongue more. This year, I can be further along with my battle of sin. This year, I can move on from who I was. And look, this is great. That's a little about Jesus. Like, he's not saying, on your own power. We don't have what, what is within us to change this. Romans 8, 11 says this. If the power of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And so, look, this promise is not some weak, humanistic, I can just manifest it if I think it, nonsense. This is the power of God that dwells in you to bring life to where there has only been death. Death is should, can is life. God rose not to should you into life, but he rose that you can have life. That's good news this morning. And I'm telling you that because Satan wants to keep you chained to the shoulds. He wants you to think you should be there and you should be here and you should have done this. And certainly God has given us direction in our life. But Jesus did not die so you should have a new life. He died so you can have new life. Jesus did not die so you should be a new creation. He died so you can be a new creation. Jesus died so so you should be better. Jesus died so you could be completely transformed. The power of the word can only rests in the Holy Spirit who resides in you. The gospel promises frees us from should and the shame that incapacitates growth for all of us. So look, did you fail the test of the tongue? Did you fail the test of the heart? Did you fail the test of the whole life? Yeah, me too. Me too. Good. It gives us reality. Now look, reality isn't always pleasant, but it's always helpful. It gives us a starting point. So you know what? Together we can live more and more unstained by the world, by the power that is within us. You and I can grow and will grow this year by the grace and power of God. You know how I know that? You know how I know that you can and I can grow by the power and grace of God? Because it's God the Father who grows us. And God the Father makes sure that all the apples fall right near the tree. Let's pray. God, we are grateful. We're just grateful this morning for a new year. Grateful for the ability to take hold of who you are, that we might understand the power of the gospel. That we might be freed to experience change as you've designed. That we might be free to, to throw off the shackles of shame. The voice of Satan in our head saying we're not enough, we'll never be enough, that you're tired of us, that you don't want to give us grace, that you're disgusted by us. These things that are just patently false. God, I pray that you would give us the wisdom and the courage to shout down those lies. And we might accept the truth that the same power that rose Jesus from the grave is at work within us to give life to our mortal bodies. That where there was death, by your power there will be life. I pray that I would feel that that I would experience that this year. I pray that your church would experience that. I pray that those around us who may be far from you but near to us might experience and see your grace before they hear the gospel. And there might be people who come to know you because of that. I pray these things in your name. Amen. We're going to move.